questions, I think we can move on to the next speaker. It's Dr. Zol Garmi, who is an expert on neurosynology and transcranial Dopplers. And Dr. Zol, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I would like to thank you for coming and participating in our boot camp. Uh, so these are your sources, uh, the middle, hard to read, but Edelman ultrasound physics and the Stradness duplex. Uh, those are uh, my favorite reference for you guys. And I would like to really thank for those question mark. Uh, yesterday you guys answered me for my questions because that tells me that I really have a future. So I shouldn't give up on training you and I think uh, this is a very good start. Uh, on the other side, I have the one pager. That one pager, it's interpret all the vascular studies rest of your life if you need, and most likely we're not gonna change it, uh, the criteria. Um, the carotid grading we will get back to. So about ultrasound, uh, definitely it's a, a little bit of physics I need to teach you. And one of the most important is here on the bottom of the screen. Uh, that what you can hear is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Everything above is going to be the ultrasound. Sound, please. Okay, that's about 10, 12, 14, 18 kilohertz. Can you guys can hear this? That's syphilis. Uh, so. If you have a hearing loss, that's different. Uh, so after 20, when you don't hear this, that's the ultrasound. I'm so sorry. Um, that's a HIPAA violation. But remember this audio notch website and, and practice this sound. Because if you have a tinnitus, this is how you can kill it. I don't want to kill you, so I will just advance. And if you play on the piano, so those are the frequencies on a piano. And you need a double and a half piano to really get to the two megahertz. And this is where you can probably start to play ultrasound. So that's the one equation. Uh, you just need to remember how the lambda comes out uh, from uh, the speed and the frequency. Uh, so this is C divided by the F. And also it's very important that not just the ultrasound, but also the medium. Uh, density and the speed plays a huge role. And believe it or not, for some reason, all the uh, uh, RPVI, they would like to hear what is the soft tissue speed of the ultrasound. So blood is the 1580, the soft tissue is 1540. For some reason, you have to remember that. When you see an ultrasound screen, the first thing you would like to see, uh -huh, and I cannot point, uh, this color scale. Red coming towards you, blue is going away, and you can see this vessel is coming from a deep towards the surface. This is why your rhombus is really showing that the head is on that side. So this is your carotid. From the bulb, the vessel is diving. From a bulb going to the IC, you notice the rhombus is changed. No, the rhombus is the other way, and your color box, if you wouldn't cut it off with the screen, uh, it's flipped now. So the signal going away is red. So the flow orientation, the first look of the ultrasound screen, almost orient yourself with that color box. Um, the rest is the transducer position. So depending on which position you hold the transducers and how you have the reference, what's coming towards you is going away, you can make a blood flow come towards your probe go away. So this is just simple physics. Uh, what I'm really proud of and um, trying to educate our guys is the numbers, the velocity is not enough. You really need to study the waveform. Waveform almost like an extra language you need to kind of learn. A first signal on the left, this is a nice low resistance waveform. We have flow in systole and diastole. The second signal, your high resistance waveform, it's in the arm and leg. You have a little bit of minimal flow in diastole. The post stenotic waveform, uh, the last one, is really easy. But what you notice is that your systolic upstroke is gone. When your systolic upstroke is not there, that tells you that between your measurement point and the heart, there's obstruction. It's your job and go back to figure out where this obstruction is. And most likely, if you find that obstruction, the stenosis, will show up with the increased velocity. 
So in the increased velocity, but the post-stenotic, this blunted waveform, when you delay, have the systolic upstroke is delayed, that's kind of indirect sign uh, for your signal. Demonstration, uh, this one, high resistance, beautiful signal, low resistance. What's between an occlusion? So for occlusion, uh, one of the things that we sample and you see nothing in it, when it's dark as your lumen, that's acute. When it's getting darker, uh, brighter, 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 there's going to be a chronic occlusion. And also you can see the size of the vessel didn't change. If it's not collapsed, that's also an indication of a fresh occlusion. Another thing you notice that we are dropping the scale. So when you're looking for an occlusion, when you really define a tiny flow that your scale number is going lower, 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 it means you're trying to find a trickle of flow. So by the Nyquist limit, whatever this number is, you double it, that's the most um, sensitive speed value what the ultrasound going to get. So here, 26, you best for a, a flow of 50. You probably not going to display a full uh, with this one if it's less than 10. So this is why you need to drop for the occlusion less than 10. Also, the venous flow, the color scale is dropped under 10 in our protocol. And I think the waveform, let's give you a really beautiful information about the blood flow. And you notice the systolic upstroke has this kind of dip, that V. That is your vessel compliance. That's why you have a little bit of muscle in the wall. So here, the arrow. Hmm, my mouse is gone. So I'm going to show it really fast. So you're reaching systole and you are met with a resistance. When your systolic peak reaches the resistance, you cannot increase the speed anymore. It kind of drops. That's why you have the vessel dilates a little bit and push again. So this is, you know, that this is not chronic hypertension. That's a very good vessel compliance with a good positivity. It's not a rigid vessel because able to do that V. So your second notch is your aortic valve closure. And uh, the difference between these two signal, blunted middle cerebral artery flow or a good systolic upstroke, that your carotid artery is open, your carotid artery is occluded. And it's not a clot. Sometimes you see no flow in it because you have a dissection further up. This is why the flow can get in. But the waveform, uh, we just love the waveform, and we like to map our collaterals. When you do a carotid study, you map ophthalmic, ACOM, and PCOM as a collaterals. That's a, one of our uh, favorite projects. To, uh, to give you a little bit more information, right, and to just, hey, this is a 70% stenosis. So watch the waveform. I'm blocking the carotid. This is what happens distal to it. I'll block the carotid, normal flow. Cool? If you like it, uh, there's definitely a simulator. The simulator is hemodynamic.com, free of charge, just play at home. Um, I'm, this is a little bit more cardiology, but aortic balloon pump waveform kind of alter your waveforms, kind of get ready what happens. One of my favorite and simple criteria for any diagnosis, waveform doubles or the speed doubles, then it's a 50%. Three times, four times, 70% stenosis. Any given same tube, same blood vessel, uh, we apply that criteria. This is my waveforms for the subclavian still. For a dead normal vertebral to all the way to the reverse vertebral waveform, these are the steps what you're going to see. First, just a V-shape cutout alternating way from crossing your zero line, and finally a reversed vertebral artery. Those are the stations that you kind of helps you. First, you check your blood pressure, pulse differences, but the waveform is your definite diagnosis. So we talked about yesterday about those questions, and one of the one thing that you want to remember is how do you diagnose a 70% carotid? Peak systole over 230, and I stick over 100 and the ratio over four. If you learn this much on a boot camp, you know which carotid you want to do surgery on. And this is not my criteria. This is 2003, uh, not the last century, but this century. But over 15 years ago, a consensus made by this multiple specialty team published. So we should use it. And I think we are moving towards, uh, this is from a publication, that uh, 
when you have a report, you need to have an accredited lab, and that logo will be uh, showing you that your lab is accredited. One really fancy way for, uh, form I want to show you, this is Dr. Spencer and Reed curve. Uh, in the 70s, they were playing with CW Doppler, just compressing on a tube to see what's the grade of the stenosis. So from the total uh, flow to the total occlusion, you see the velocities going up, going up, going up. There's no effect until reach of 70% cross-section reduction, and that's why we call something hemodynamic significant. At 70%, the flow volume starts to drop. This is when the two curves is crossing, so tell you that you cannot deliver the same amount of flow anymore, so that's why uh, kind of significant. So remember the subclavian feeding the arm, high resistance, ICA feeding the brain, low resistance, ECA feeding the muscle needs to be high resistance. These are just show you some good examples, and that's a nice uh, tight ICA stenosis. So most likely you're going to operate on this one. And uh, one of the other things is that sometimes you see some really strange waveform. This not barely pulsatile ICA waveform tells you there's obstruction proximal, so that may be maybe a CCA stenosis. But may likely next door, your cardiologist friends already arranged an ALVAD. Sometimes you will be surprised how the non positive ALVAD waveforms can uh, look like that. Um, the other thing is on your carotid ultrasound, you need to be ready for some jugular uh, clots. And this is a little bit more aged, so you see a little bit brighter. And on your ultrasound, we use the power Doppler because it's not really sensitive for velocities. So when you think about near occlusion, you need to decide between open or not. You really need to go after your power Doppler, or you want to use this uh, uh, B-flow. Uh, sorry, I just want to go back one more. So this B-flow looks like a, you give a contrast, but it's not. It just labels all the red blood cells, and the B-flow is on the G unit. So here's a nice clot again in IJ. So why are we doing the carotids? We're also looking at the surrounding tissue. Uh, thyroids. Thyroid looks like that. Uh, it's not a good thing. So we also have incidental finding in our carotid report. And I'm sure that we're going to have a lecture about a nice global tumor, this is how it looks like when you have a nice uh, uh, tumor just next to a carotid uh, bifurcation. On the YouTube, we published our uh, beautiful protocol. I hope you recognize my neck. I couldn't find any better volunteer, so I just gave my neck. Um, this is my uh, lead sonographer, and this is the best way to show you what you do with your left hand, what you do, do with your probe, and what your artery uh, supposed to look like. And we build a protocol that you just hit next, next, next. So you're avoiding all labeling, all the changes and stuff. So if you, use a, if you have this fancy technology, we just need to learn how to tune it and uh, program it for our hand. I just want to scare you. This is before the carotid ultrasound, the oculoplasmatography. Patient had an IV running. They're pushing on the eyeball. This is how we diagnose carotid disease. So definitely we advance just a little bit. So lift your arm up if you think this is a dissection. This is not a morning exercise, but I'm happy. This is an ascending pharyngeal artery. Originates right behind the ICA, and because of the clamp injury, had a stenosis at the origin. So you need to be ready uh, to really differentiate, but first always think about anatomy before you call it a dissection. Really looks like a double lumen. Really looks like uh, a dissection. This is our gorgeous report. I'm really proud that we have an image. Oops, I'm sorry, we need to cut out the name. Um, image of the uh, study, but also the numbers. and, and the, My favorite two demonstration, patient lift up the arm, the monitoring the PCA, the flow disappears. Patient had a carotid subclavian bypass. You assume it's working fine. He drops the arm, the flow comes back. And just one more, I think. So we are monitoring the PCA. He lifts his arm, he got lightheaded immediately. That's the most hemodynamic you can get. And this is what the ultrasound helps you. By angio, you don't see anything. It's fine, there's no stenosis. Look at the vert origin, nice and calcified on the CTA. And Ponraj, I hope you learned something from Ponraj yesterday. Colored angio called eye flow. Arm is down, arm is up a second delay getting a flow to the vertebral. 
just positioning. Again, I think that Angio is jealous for the ultrasound being hemodynamic. So Angio kind of follows, and basically you put your cursor, you can time how or when the contrast arrives to your vertebral. And this is my favorite case. Uh, MRI says carotid occluded. CTA says carotid occluded. My ultrasound says carotid is open. Angio confirmed it. And what is the difference between open carotid or not? Remember the CTA MR done with a straight head. Ultrasound, patient slightly turns the head. That position was enough to open up the carotid. So I hope you learned something yesterday. If not, I already have a robot doing your job, so be careful. Thank you, guys.